Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. When you think of a science lab at Wyoming's community colleges, what comes to mind? Maybe four walls, some windows, some students, and some beakers? How about the Denwoody Glacier in Wyoming's Wind River Range? The Interdisciplinary Climate Change Expedition, ICE, with two C's at Central Wyoming College, next on Wyoming Chronicle. ICE has two C's in what we're visiting about today. I'm with Jackie Clancher, an environmental sciences instructor here at Central Wyoming Co College. Jackie, welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. You're involved in a program, the Interdisciplinary Climate, um, Climate Change Expedition, ICE. That's is correct. A new mnemonic. Tell us about that just briefly. ICE is entering its third year. It's a two-week undergraduate research expedition that transpires in the Fitzpatrick Wilderness. And it has many facets, but primarily we're looking at the relationship between the loss of Wyoming's glaciers and the impacts on both ecology and hydrology. And what's unique about this, it involves students who are undergraduates, they're freshmen and sophomore level students from Central Wyoming College. Absolutely, it is a student-centered, student-focused, <coughs> uh, student-built expedition and research project that is specifically designed not only to perform research, but moreover to help those students shine and become better academics and professionals. I think a way that we can introduce this um, project to our viewers is to show a video that our colleague Kyle Nikoloff has made for us as part of um, some greater work that he plans to do. Let's show our viewers that video right now. intense, it's fascinating, it's all-consuming. It can be draining, but it's also exhilarating. Today really is the culmination of a couple of years of effort in remeasuring the depth of the, the Dinwoody. Your job is, is primarily to um, hold it in line uh, as we're walking across the glacier so it doesn't slide downhill. How do you get a glacier? It's because of mass balance. It's because you get more snow and ice than you, that's accumulating than is melting. Snow falls and it falls and it lands on the side of the mountains and it starts building up because every summer comes and not as much snow melts as falls in the winter. So that's a positive mass balance in glacier speed. What we're doing right now is we're basically starting off at the terminus of the glacier. 
and we're using our GPS to create a trek for our path and we're basically walking up the fingers of the glacier to trace the terminus. We have opted to commit only to where we're absolutely sure there's ice still underneath. So we're identifying the fingers that are so scree and talus and marine covered that we can't determine whether there's ice under and go around them. So today, Jackie Clancher and I hiked up to the Dinwiddie Cert and the reason we did that was to collect water samples because it's such a highly impacted area by climbers and hikers alike that we realized that their waste management ideas are not always correct and that some of that waste is going into the water. Oh, essentially we're looking for the difference between is there more presence of E. coli in heavily used areas versus less impacted areas mm -hmm. where there may be either less E. coli or none. We're trying to get down to the, the whitest looking snow that we can find. And black carbon isn't something that you're supposed to be able to see with the naked eye. Right now he's pushing the water through the syringe and that water going through the filter, everything will be caught in that filter that's from this water sample. These samples we took today are going to be sent off to University of Wyoming so they can study their isotopes and get them analyzed to find the true source of the black carbon. Jackie, as the research that, that you're doing, have you reached any conclusions yet? We are advancing in our data collection. Initially, as I said, because the emphasis is so finely focused on students, the first year we really were getting our feet wet going, can this work? Can we collect data in a capital W wilderness area with the tools and the bodies and the means we have to do that and collect it well? And from there we have started to accumulate data. We never were searching to determine whether or not the glaciers were receding. We know that they are. But we were looking to be able to quantify that and say by how much and could we contribute to the greater body of science by suggesting at what rate they might be disappearing and what the ecological implications are. How does that impact insect communities, for instance? So what have you learned? At this point, because we have so many spokes to our project, uh, we certainly quantifiably can say through the use <coughs> of ground penetrating radar uh, on loan to us from the University of Wyoming that a transect that had been uh, performed in the first in the 90s and later in the mid 2000s across the Dinwiddie Glacier using ground penetrating radar when we repeated that transect we can now say conclusively and quantifiably that it is measurably measurably lower to bedrock than it was during those early transects so not only can we go on the glacier and say, boy, this feels like it's about two meters lower than it was last year, we can actually put some data behind that and start to be able to potentially create some kind of rate of decline into the future of the ice mass. So that's one of the key areas we've looked at. Others? Others. We've worked with the National Center for Atmospheric Research and Dr. Carl Schmidt to look at whether or not there is the presence or absence of particulate matter. Anything dark in the ice is going to exacerbate melting and we've looked for evidence of incomplete combustion of fossil fuels in the form of black carbon. You can't see it with the naked eye but we're looking for that to see is it there and would we be able to source that and figure out from whence it comes, what's the origin of that. And right now we've got values that show we are typical for other places in North America, but certainly notably high for a wilderness area, high atop the continental divide. So that's another area that we'll continue to explore. Have you been able to source that carbon um, yet today? Not yet. Nope. Mm -hmm. That's our next adventure. We need to go in earlier in the spring. It needs to be obtained within a four-day period after a snowfall. And we're usually out there in August and have yet to receive fresh snowfall while we're out there, although that could certainly happen. So those are a couple of the areas that we've noticed some changes. Now you've made two treks to the Denwoody Glacier area and a third is coming this summer. That is correct. Does it, do you hope to continue the program after that? We certainly hope so. We may expand some of our parameters. We'd like to keep the core of what we're looking at, which is 
glacial ice loss specifically and the black carbon. We also have other numerous projects looking at the macroinvertebrate community, which is simply the visible insects to the eye that are big enough you can see an ID, but uh, not uh, they're not aquatic fish or amphibians or anything like that. So looking at the insect community, we want to continue with that. And really what we're looking for is change over time. Does the recession of alpine ice influence other factors ecologically? And can we measure the changes in outwash from the glacier? Most of these students who come with you, Jackie, are they, number one, from Wyoming? Number two, do they have an outdoor background? You have a significant background in the outdoors. You used to be an instructor at the National Outdoor Leadership School. How do they learn um, to, to be able to be confident to go on a two-week expedition in the winds? And that's a great question. That's the magic of what we have here at CWC, is we're able to combine forces across disciplines. So when we said it's the interdisciplinary climate change expedition, we, we really mean it. And it's across faculty, and it's across students. Our students are mixed. Some are local, some are from Wyoming, some are from the greater Rocky Mountain West, and some are from all over the nation. Those students have ended up here so far, for the most part, as participants in Darren Wells' outdoor education program. From there, they take one of my classes in environmental science, and we start to weave together these two fields that really nicely interconnect outdoor education, wilderness travel, and scientific research. And from there, we start to really build on the skills that Darren's program gives them as backcountry travelers sets them up, trains them, sometimes acclimatizes them if they're in the field directly before our expedition. And from there, our goal is to be able to emphasize the research and the travel and keeping everybody safe, but having less time on the ground actually teaching wilderness travel skills. So very tight relationship amongst our disciplines here. <clears throat> What's remarkable to me is, again, these are two-year students at a community college in Wyoming. These aren't graduate students, so there's a lot really for them to parse together. Is this a terminal program for many of your students or do they all go on to advanced degrees at, at a four-year school? Or wh what are they doing once they've participated in your program, have you discovered? We are, we trace them very carefully. We work with our funders and with University of Wyoming and other institutions to keep track of our students. And I can say conclusively, the primary goal we had in doing this was to see could we take students from archaeology and outdoor education and environmental science and embed them in a field research project, take them to the place they love and they want to be in the mountains, and expand their interests both in continuing academically and expand their interests in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and help launch their professional and academic careers. And I can say conclusively, without searching my brain much, there's three or four students for sure that were pretty much done. They were going to complete their associates in outdoor ed and they wanted to go to work. And we've sent at least four students to the University of Wyoming from this program who were at a stall when they were involved in ICE. And from there, they're excited to continue their black carbon research, to go on with macroinvertebrate research, to continue on in ground penetrating radar fields. It works. Now, you've made a pretty bold statement, and I, um, something that you've said before, and I want to read it directly because it's a quote of yours. ICE has completely changed our students' lives and how they succeeded in the classroom. That's a pretty bold statement, that this program has had that sort of impact. I guess if you think of the classroom as a circular relationship, if students are turned on and invested, they will work endlessly and tirelessly for you. That in turn inspires us to work harder, engage more, be more creative. And that circle of events has drastically changed how those students have performed, not only for me in the classroom, but for other instructors, and inspired them to go on. And I shouldn't say all will end up at the University of Wyoming. They have different goals and aspirations in, in slightly different fields of STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. But unequivocally, this has inspired them to sink their teeth into something beyond just classroom research or classroom study, but to engage in their own original research. Uh, as an example, we have a student who will publish this year with the National Center for Atmospheric Research, assuming their article is accepted. He's working on that article, and he's primarily self-driven at this point. He's working with Dr. Carl Schmidt, and they're on their own creating a paper that will go out for peer review. That would have been inconceivable prior to ICE for this student, but 
he's really bright, and now he has the motivation to, to continue on academically. Let's talk for just a moment about prior to IAS. What's the gen genesis of this idea? How did it come about? Um, you can thank the power of the media for inspiring both my students and myself in this particular realm. James Baylog is an internationally acclaimed photographer and he in turn was funded by the National Science Foundation to complete the extreme ice survey. He placed time-lapse cameras um, at various positions on glaciers throughout the world. Those time-lapse cameras were in turn uh, designed and orchestrated by Dr. Neil Humphrey at the University of Wyoming. And their film Chasing Ice is fantastic. It provides foundational education in glaciology and climate change and hydrology and research but moreover it takes students and puts them in the palm of the hand of science and says you could do this and so when we watched that film in class it was recommended to me by a student at the end everyone just sat stunned and I did too it's a fantastic film and one of the students who sort of soft-spoken said so Jackie, do you think like we could do something like that? And truly, that was the genesis. My instant response was not necessarily, of course, it was, <clears throat> let's think on that. But really within the next week and before the end of the semester, we had grants out the door and we had crafted a plan. I wanna talk about that. Um, students don't just show up when it's the day before to go up to the Wind Rivers here. They participate in securing grants. They're participating in, in um, post-trip research and, and analysis, et cetera. The whole realm of, of the project really is in students' hands, it sounds like. They have a tremendous amount of responsibility. And although I say the actual ICE, the Interdisciplinary Climate Change Expedition, is a two-week undergraduate expedition, it really isn't at all. That's the field portion. That's the data collection portion. But the pre-expedition prep starts now, essentially, for new students doing literature reviews and preparing for the season and continues all the way through to the end of April or early May at Undergraduate Research Day where students present their posters or they, some of them will actually do um, physical presentations where they're talking to an audience. There's a mix. And depending on which facet of the expedition they're involved in, some students are actively and have actively written their own grants. Some I handle, they're just, that's, they're directed towards faculty and they need to come out of my mouth. And some are student level um, research grants and students are chasing those as well. What recognition has this program received in the last couple of years? Are people starting to know and understand that um, its relevance um, and, its, and its goals? I think it's been very well received. I think part of it is the physical environment. Um, there's something very alluring and attractive about students working hard at high elevations. And so from various groups, whether it's been the media or whether it's been a software provider that we use to collect our geospatial data to make our maps, we've gotten a lot of recognition in the press. Um, certainly we've been well represented by Wyoming PBS in working with Kyle Nikoloff to collect film data on this or film uh, coverage on the expedition and um, we've been invited to submit abstracts to international conferences. I presented in Canada and in, in San Francisco so far and we hope to go to Europe next fall to to present at another conference and I should add because <clears throat> excuse me we're, we're mixed of so many disciplines we have archaeology, outdoor mm -hmm. ed, environmental science and all mixed in between is geospatial information science and technology that we use to collect spatial data and create our maps and represent our data in a visual format so again i mean I, it's just remarkable that these these are freshmen and sophomores in in college will this summer's trip be any different than the previous two is there any is there anything different that you're planning to do each year we expand so the first year was a test you know working with great faculty i said i have this idea i'd like to take a trip that exists and I would like to embed a scientific research module into that trip and see what happens. Will it light students' fire? Will they be hungry to come back? Will they rise to the occasion? Can they think and carry a 60-pound pack in the mountains? Can they excel in both intellectually, physically, emotionally, in terms of group dynamics, the whole package? Will it work? And it worked marvelously. So this, pardon me. Have there been any hurdles? <clears throat> have, have there been some struggles? Um, it's tough work. 
it's tough work. Um, we don't really build in a rest day and students get tired and they have to get along and they're at elevation and we ask them to be thinking and plotting and taking care of gear. That's probably one of our challenges but um, each year it evolves and so you'd ask you know would it change for this this summer coming up. We will continue with the data collection that we've been collecting over the past couple years but each year we expand. So this year we've branched off into two fields, which is both the glaciology, hydrology, and in archaeology. So we have two separate expeditions uh, running throughout the summer, and we have many, many goals and dreams as we go into the future. But we don't want to lose the core because the power of that data collection is looking at changes across time. One of your, um, one of your fingers, if you would, of the <clears throat> project was to determine whether humans have had impact in that area and you did some work last year relative to that. What did you learn? We did indeed. Uh, we were really uh, concerned with the amount of traffic that goes into the Dinwiddie Cirque and at the base of Gannett that there might be visible, measurable or impacts, evidence of impacts of E. And this coli is, this in the is water. the base just so our viewers can kind of pin it on a map, the base of Gannett Peak in Wyoming. Yep. Mm -hmm. A lot of travel there, including us. We are roughly a group of 15 and when we stay in that area for five days, there's human waste to manage and we were concerned about our impact on streams and happily from the grab samples that we got last year we could say at least for that snapshot in time there was no visible evidence no measurable evidence biological evidence that we were impacting that stream that was just a glimmer but we did uh, do that in part to see what are our measurable impacts when we're in there doing scientific research? What is what are the hurdles post trip? In other words, um, you, you you come back home, you have a relationship with the University of Wyoming and perhaps others to help you with the analysis after you have gathered the data on site. We do indeed. We work with Dr. Bradley Carr and the Wyoming Center for Environmental Hydrology at the University of Wyoming. Um, we work with Dr. Carl Schmidt. We're working with the University of North Dakota. It takes a lot of time to keep communications fluid and sometimes our students have graduated at the end of that research and they're already across the country in other institutions or they're at the University of Wyoming. I think the biggest hurdle is just maintaining communications and that is where it has to be a two-way two street. The students have to be invested and inspired and when they're driving it saying, Jackie, abstracts are due, can you read our abstracts? that's immeasurably better than me going, we got to get abstracts written. Here's how you write an abstract. Mm -hmm. and, and the team I have right now is fantastic. They're chasing me saying, I need you to proof this. We've got to be ready to present. So communication is probably the biggest hurdle and just the time that we sink into it on top of all the other things that we do in the classroom. Another general conclusion that, that you've talked about is that um, relative to the rapid glacial ice loss, um, saying that it has really significant and serious implications for downstream communities. And in this part of Wyoming, we're talking about the Wind River Indian, Indian Reservation, Lander, and Riverton. What have you learned, and, and how serious, really, are these implications? We're a small piece of the scientific body on this, but certainly what the data has shown hitherto is that these glaciers are a measurable and significant contributor to downstream surface water. Early studies from the 90s and into 2000 said anywhere between 6 and 25 percent with an average of 13 percent. Other institutions doing research contemporarily would argue that those numbers are conservative and if we think of how big the impact is of not getting a recent spring snowfall for instance where we get that two inches of water equivalent in a spring storm if we lost 25 percent of surface water for the Wind River Indian Reservation or for the Wyoming Basin that's phenomenal in, a, in, a, in communities that often only accumulate 10 inches or slightly less or slightly above. That's a significant portion. And because the environment is so extreme to access and to perform research in as a wilderness area, because it's heavily permitted, it's, it's rugged, it's well-preserved, there's no motorized vehicles, you need to work tightly with the Forest Service for permitting, to do research and to do any filming. Because of all those things, it's mostly out of sight, out of mind. And I don't think anyone, for the most part in the common populace, unless they travel the land considerably, has any idea how fast those glaciers are receding. You, um, um, the, the, the future of this project depends on funding, but you've had funding support. What, what has that funding support been and who has it been from? 
We have been very well supported. We hustle for it, but we have been well supported. The NASA Space Grant Consortium supports us very well. The IDEA Network of Biomedical Research Excellence, or INBRI, supports our E. coli research. Um, the Experimental Program to Stimulate Competitive Research, which is EPSCOR, and the Wyoming Center for Environmental Hydrology have all supported us well. We get tremendous support as well through the National Outdoor Leadership School, just in terms of them really, uh, I guess, being generous in how well they support our students and in terms of rental and uh, sat phones, et cetera. So we also appreciate their support. Is this the future for what you do, Jackie? In other words, um, bending away from the traditional lecture classroom lab um, um, work of, of what, what somebody who took a biology class many years ago may, might have experienced or a science class might have experienced. Is, how, is this ultra important now for students to really have this hands-on approach? I believe it is. I think to be competitive as a graduate student, it's too late if you write your first hypotheses in graduate school. That's not acceptable anymore. Students need to be practicing. And maybe their early hypotheses and maybe their early research plans, they might be terrible. Most people used to be that way in graduate school, but now they're practicing in the first year, the second year. I think it very much sets the trend. And over time, certainly, how I teach in the classroom has changed fantastically from standing in front, directing my way through PowerPoints to getting students doing, doing, thinking, writing, preparing, and trying to engage them. Maybe not always in this research project. Not, this isn't the project for all students, but something they can sink their teeth into. We have just about a minute left. There's also been an archeological bend towards this, this project. Tell us briefly about that. Absolutely, if our first year was an embedded module just to look around, we had a couple of students that year who did a reconnaissance mission. Last year we took my cohort, uh, Todd Gunther, into the field with his archeology span students and they made some incredible discoveries, what they believe to be the highest buffalo jump in North America, as Todd would likely like to be quoted as saying, and found tremendous evidence that people have been chasing ice up the Dinwiddie Valley and up into the Dinwiddie Cirque for the past 12,000 years. It's exciting and that's also a project I think we want to look into as well. But Jackie, best wishes on the future of your research, um, your future of leading um, young people here in, at Central Wyoming College. Thank you for joining us on Wyoming Chronicle. Thanks so much, Craig. Pleasure.